So hi all, and um, welcome to our fifth episode. Today we are being joined by Charlie Gleason, founder of Zit Mobility and a recent graduate of Quinn School of Business. Charlie's worked in both asset management and corporate finance and finds himself starting the evolution of e-scooters in Ireland. So Charlie, lovely to, lovely to meet you um, again. Uh, I know we've tried a couple of times to get on, uh, so you're more than welcome. Thanks for having me on, cheers. Good man. So Charlie, listen, um, tell us a little bit about why e-scooters and, and why you started Zip Mobility. Yeah, um, I suppose when I was in college, I was just kind of reading up on the topic. Like I saw what was happening on the West Coast of America with the likes of Bird and Lime. Um, and I saw like there was massive consumer demand for these uh, shared scooters. So for people who don't know, it's <clears throat> essentially the same as like Bleeper Bikes, the bike sharing company, or maybe even similar to um, Dublin Bikes uh, in the, you can see in the city centre except the only difference really is that um, there's no docking station. So they're kind of free floating. And the way it's worked is you download the app on your phone and you go up to the scooter, you scan the QR code located on the scooter that initiates the electrics um, and then you ride to your destination. It's as simple as that. So I kind of saw what was happening on the West Coast of America, found it really fascinating. And then um, we had a college project that was kind of like, you know, if you could bring one business to Ireland, what would it be? Um, so I said, look, there's a good opportunity to kind of do some market research. So um, I kind of just started it and then it kind of snowballed and, you know, applied for the likes of the Dragon's Den competition in college and moved on there from to, you know, accelerator program, uh, got a place in Nova UCD for the summer. Um, and that's when I could really, you know, focus full time on it. And uh, yeah, it's kind of snowballed since. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and you know, just tell, tell, tell some of the listeners about the, the, you know, the future of electric scooters in Ireland. And obviously there's some legislation there that, that needs passing. And, and where are you at at the moment with Zip Mobility? Yeah, so if we go down the boring route, I'll tell you a little bit about the legislation. So I suppose there's two things. There's an argument whether electric scooters are classed as mechanically propelled vehicles or mechanically assisted vehicles. Now, in simple terms, should they be classed as a motorbike where you need insurance, tax, you know, the vehicles need to be registered, uh, you need a license, or should they be just, you know, bicycles where, you know, anyone can just hop on one and use one. Mm. Um, so there's kind of a gray area as to what they're classed as, you know, the RSA say one thing, the guards might say another thing. Um, and yeah, so essentially it doesn't really make a difference for us which one they are. As long as a gray area exists, we can't launch on public road. Um, so the strategy then from our perspective is, um, okay, well, let's launch off of public roads while this grey area is being ironed out. So we're launching on university campuses across Ireland. Um, so that kind of, you know, it, it allows us to prove demand, prove our safety, uh, prove unit economics and stuff like that. So when the legislation does change, we'll be in a pole position to get licenses. And, you know, we've been developing relationships with count, local councils um, and, and, you know, the process has definitely started. Now, um, the future is kind of... It, you know, it's kind of hard to know, but one thing is what is for sure is that it's going to be fast tracked by COVID-19. Um, so if we look at what's happened in the UK, and uh, the UK were actually a little bit behind us in their in their legislation um, and in their process of you know public consultations and stuff like that. Um, but only you know two weeks ago or last week, um, they announced emergency legislation for e-scooters essentially. So they were supposed to trial them um, in 2021. That's now um, actually happening in three weeks' time. So, um, as you can imagine, um, there's huge opportunity now in the UK market. That's kind of completely opened up. There were supposed to be four trials, and now that's kind of, you know, um, the local councils in the UK are, have now been given permission to launch e-scooter sharing schemes if they want to. Um, so, yeah, for, for operators like us, there's obviously huge opportunity in the UK. Um, and I'd be very surprised if Ireland didn't follow suit. It's very hard to know when. Um, but, you know, we're kind of one of maybe two countries in Europe now that uh, e-scooters are still illegal. So um, hopefully that'll get ironed out fairly soon. Brilliant, brilliant. And so you talk about, like, you've obviously gone through a lot of learnings uh, through the journey you've, 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 you've gone with Zip Mobility. What are some of the key pointers that you, you can look at and you could share with, with others thinking about, you know, setting up their own company? Obviously, you're setting up something that hasn't even been you know, gone through legislation in Ireland and it's, it's, you're probably having to jump through multiple different loopholes. And I can only imagine, you know, what you've gone through. What, what have you learned from, from, from your journey? Yeah, like when we got started, there's a lot of people just saying, like, why are you bothering? Like, the, you know, the, they're illegal in Ireland. Like, what, what are you trying to do here? 
Um, but we kind of, you know, we had a hunch that, you know, the legislation is going to change and it's kind of come to fruition every week with, you know, maybe it's another public consultation, maybe it's, you know, what's happening in the UK, just things are moving and we know, we know that things are moving. Uh, we're looking at what happened in, say, Germany and things like that. And like, we know the le- like legislation changing, scooters launching, scooters being a massive success. And that's just happening time and time again throughout Europe. And it's going to happen in Ireland. Um, my key learnings, I suppose, at the start, I suppose, I used to always talk to, you know, investors. And I used to always kind of point out, you know, that I'm young and point out, you know, oh, well, like, is it going to be really hard for me to get investment because I'm young? And that's just not the case at all, I don't think. Um, as long as you've got, you know, a serious strategy um, and, you know, you've got a strong team or, you know, a strong, not even, a, you don't even need to have a strong team. You need to just be able to point out, you know, these are our gaps. These are the people we're going to hire to fill these gaps. Um, I don't think age, you know, plays as much of a, it's not as much of a factor as I thought it was going to be. Obviously, you need to have experience, but they could be in the form of advisors or, uh, you know, board members or things like that, as opposed to, you know, a founding, you know, the actual founder. And, um, you know, you can fill the gaps with uh, people around you and kind of complement your skill set with other people. Um, another thing I might say is like, you know, at the start, we got knocked back a lot. Like, you know, uh, we might go for a university and we get positive feedback and then, you know, or maybe a risk assessment or something like that happens. And that pushes us back. And then we have to kind of go back against it. And there's this backwards and forwards of us trying to convince them how safe it is. And, you know, some universities not wanting to take the first step because obviously, e-scooters are so new in Ireland you know Ireland's got a big claim culture and things like that so it, it's just it, it's a tricky one um, so they kind of it's been like this it's been a lot of highs a lot of lows and um, I used to take them very personally I think um, I used to take the lows very personally and say Jesus you know yesterday was flying and now it looks like it's going under or whatever um, but I think most founders in every industry will have this and I think that it's kind of just like you know, once you realize these highs and lows are just part of the process as opposed to, you know, your wrongdoings or your lack of effort or anything like that, once you realize it's part of the process, everything gets a lot easier. You stop taking it personally and you just keep working. Brilliant. Brilliant. So in, in terms of, of, of the lows of where, where it's allowed you to be today, you know, what, what let's say, three points have got, got you to where you are? If, if we could just summarize it in, like... Um, so the one thing I would say is, uh, you know, gotten to where I am, I, I wouldn't even consider myself anywhere near a successful right. entrepreneur as kind of complimentary as, as the title of this video is. Uh, you know, we still have a lot to prove and we still have a lot to work towards. Um, I don't know if I, could, if I could say three is just have a great strategy. Um, uh, resilience is extremely important. And, um, you know, be patient. Be patient. Things aren't going to happen overnight, especially like, you know, people, off, you know, it's very easy for me to get bogged down and say like, you know, oh, it's been nearly 12 months now and, uh, you know, we don't have a huge amount to show for us. Now we do, but it can be very easy to convince yourself that you don't. We don't have scooters on the ground. But, you know, I knew from day one what I was getting into and inevitably, um, you know, scooter sharing was going to be a slow burner when uh, e-scooters mm-hmm. were illegal when we started. So uh, it's all about getting everything in place, um, everything, you know, is ready to go at the push of a button. Um, so when, when things do change on the legislative front, uh, we're ready to go. Brilliant, brilliant. You, you, you spoke there about, you know, you've obviously done a huge amount of market research in the field and, you, you know, it's very evident that, you, that you've put in, put in the hours to realise, right, how other countries are operating. You've got, obviously, some good advisors on the board. Um, how, how important is it for, for a startup to really realise their competition um, and how, how important was it for, for you to understand, right, this hasn't been done before, what do we have to do, and what are the areas we need to concentrate on most? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think when, what I touched on there was like, you know, age doesn't matter when I started saying that, you need to have a good strategy. Actually, probably the most important thing if you're young, particularly if you're young, you need to know your market inside out. Like, you really need to know that. Um, you know, investors are clever, you know, this obviously, um, but you need to know, you need to be able to show that you know everything. You've read everything, you know everything about the industry. You can say, you know, if they say, okay, for example, where did that financial assumption come from? You can say, well, this company in the States um, had, you know, this um, metric or whatever, or, you know, this was their average so-and-so. Uh, and you can, you can give comparables of companies in the US, companies in, you know, Paris, for our, us, Paris, Germany, things like that. Uh, and you just need to have the stats and facts to kind of back up everything that you're saying. I think that's really important for people. You just need to know your market inside out. Um, 
sorry, I kind of lost track of the rest of the question there. No, it's just it, the you know the importance of the, of what you've learned over the last three years yeah. has been a lot about other markets and how you know key indicators are are allowing you to further develop what you're doing in Ireland and the evolution of e-scooters yeah. and it, it, yeah. it's yeah. Regardless of what industry you're in, it's it's going to be one of the, you know, the key learnings is right. How is this being adapted in in Ireland? Um, you know, even for ourselves, we we're in a very new field, and it's trying to you know curve a path that's that's not really been been done in a country whereby it's very new. Um, and yeah. so it, it it's really interesting because I spoke to a couple of different guys in different sectors, and you know, technology, and you know all across the board, it's right, how has this worked in other countries? And how do we learn and yeah. how do we adapt? Yeah. And I can only imagine what, you know, what sort of, you know, breakthroughs you're going to go through over the next couple of months that's really going to allow you, you must have gone through a couple of different ceilings of, you know, really trying to find your vision and find the vision for Zip Mobility. What would you envision yeah. in the next five years, um, would it be like for e-scooters and not only e-scooters, but all sorts of, of mobile transport? Um, for the next five years, obviously it's very hard to say. As I mentioned before, it's going to be fast-tracked by COVID-19. So what would have been a five-year plan or a five year, what's going to look like in five years is actually going to be the reality in kind of maybe 12, 18 months. Now, what I mean by that is, okay, so if you look at what's happening in New Ze over the last two weeks, New Zealand are, you know, investing huge money to put in temporary or pop-up bike lanes is what they're calling them. So pop-up bike lanes nationally. If you look here in Blackrock only yesterday, um, it was approved for, a, you know, a one-way system through Blackrock Village uh, to kind of make space for social distancing for footpaths and to put in new cycle lanes. You look at what's happening in London, a two billion um, climate act or a two billion um, cycling and walkway plan investment has been put in uh, for, you know, post-coronavirus because you know, public transport capacity in London is now at 10% of what it usually is. So that means 90% of compu commuters uh, can't get public transport. Um, some of the car lanes are being given to, you know, cycling and uh, pedestrianisation. So traffic is going to be worse and public transport capacity is at 10%. So the only alternative is, you know, um, the likes of scooters, um, bikes and electric bikes. So that's why the infrastructure is being put in there. So, um, you know, a cycling activist, Green Party, they've all been, you know, looking for pedestrianisation, uh, more cycle lanes, stuff like that for the last, you know, 20 years, maybe more. Uh, and all of a sudden, bike lanes are popping up overnight. And it's kind of, you know, things are happening very quickly, which, which is great news for us. Mm. Brilliant. So if we could just move on sort of slightly to the topic of, you know, uh, funding and raising funding for a startup. What, what's your journey looking like from having to raise funding and getting to where you are today? Yeah, um, it's been it's been an interesting journey. Anyway, like it's obviously been, you know, in some ways tough to get investors on board with the legislation, but other in in other ways it hasn't been. Um, you just need a, a serious, robust strategy. You need to have, um, you know, these. You know, at the start we were saying, okay, yeah, we're gonna to investors like when we when we just started off it was like, okay, we're gonna launch in Dublin, and uh, yeah, then maybe we'll launch in Galway, and they were saying, well, you know. I can pick so many holes in that because legislation, hyper competition, blah, 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 uh, you know, and it just, it didn't float. Um, now, luckily that was kind of, you know, at the very early stage where we weren't, you know, uh, mm. you know, closing doors, it was just kind of more advice and things like that. So we put together a much more robust strategy um, of, you know, okay, well, what can we do while the legislation is how it is? How are we going to get around the big competitors? So as I touched on before, you know, knowing your market, knowing your competitors is really important. But also knowing what they've done wrong is really important. Uh, you know, knowing and acknowledging mistakes that they've made and say, look, well, say for us anyway, um, you know, we're not saying there's huge competition in our market. But what we're able to say is, look, OK, yes, there's huge competition, but let's turn let's flip that from a, you know, a, a negative into a positive. And the positive is that they've made a huge amount of mistakes. And this is what we've learned from those mistakes. Mm -hmm. So once you can kind of, you know, turn a negative into a positive, you know, we're, our competitive advantage is going to be based on the mistakes that they've made. Um, so if we were first to market and if we were first in the world, we would have made all these mistakes and wasted all investors' money. Um, but now we're going to operate a lot more, you know, we're going to be a lot more lean um, and a lot better off. Um, so I suppose strategy is very important, knowing your competitors, 
um, having a team and acknowledging you know where the team is falling uh, and where you need to hire people to complement your own skill set. Uh, they're probably the three biggest ones. Uh, and having like you know good financial kind of uh, knowledge is is very useful as well because you know cash flow issues are like probably top three reasons why businesses go under. They just run out of money. Mm-hmm. So just kind of understanding and being conservative about your financial assumptions uh, is really useful as well. Yeah, we've touched on this before and going through, you know, pitch decks and, and, and short, concise, you know, having your financials there and, and the importance of having people there that can actually go into the, you know, the finer detail on them. Um, going on to, um, you know, how you're going to manage fleets come, you know, I don't know how long it's going to be, a year, two years down the line. You know, do you have any, do you have any, um, processes in place or systems that you're looking at at the moment um yeah like it's going to be a learning process like it's going to be you know thrown in the deep end you know say for example like we're given three licenses to launch in three different cities with you know 750 scooter fleet um you know there's not much planning you can do for that like you need to go okay well where's the best place to put a warehouse that will depend on the city uh where's the you know you know what are our metrics going to be around you know how many people are we going to have to charge our scooters um, per hundred scooters and things like that? Like they're all just random assumptions. What we are going to do is, you know, what we've decided is say a lot of the competitors use gig economy employees to charge and redistribute their scooters. Meaning, um, you know, say for example, I was a student in UCD. I could just sign up on the app and say, okay, I want to be a charger. I go out at night, I collect scooters, I bring them back to my house um, and I charge them overnight and, and release them the next day. Now that has allowed these companies, you know, the big unicorn scooter sharing companies to scale really quickly with virtually zero infrastructure. Um, but it's led to a huge cash burn. Like, you know, some of these companies are making nearly half a billion losses a year um, and they're only two years old. Um, so I suppose what we're going to do differently is we're going to have, you know, a centralized charging model. model. Um, so instead of, you know, taking the scooter, you know, individual contractors taking them back to their house, we can simply just, you know, have warehousing staff to, you know, charge the scooters and the other thing we're going to have is swappable batteries so instead of having to take the scooters off the streets we simply just um have a warehouse of battery packs um and then the charging staff will go out at night time and just simply swap the dead battery packs on the scooter and um, so that's much more cost cost efficient much more lean obviously you know you can't scale into you know 150 cities in 12 months doing that but at the same time it's you know it's striking that balance between scale and and, and profitability and just managing your cash uh, and I think we've kind of found that balance in theory um, and hopefully we can kind of uh, execute on it. Yeah which kind of brings us into the next topic of the infrastructure and you know we've had conversations prior about the technology behind it and it's pretty amazing to hear you know about your you know the geolocation of, of where scooters are and, and the ability to turn it off if it goes outside you know outside of campuses. Do you want to go into some some more detail on, on, on that because you know this hasn't been done in Ireland, and I'm sure people are very interested into the, the tech you have behind it. Yeah, so I suppose on a university campus anyway, the big question investors ask more so that, you know, the staff in UCD, the big question they're asking is like, you know, how do you stop someone going down to the dars on your scooter? But well, we've got a, you know, a geofence on, um, on, around the campus, and a geofence now means that, you know, say if someone's on the scooter and they're like heading for the exit and they want to go to the, the, the dart station, they get around 10 meters from the from the perimeter of the campus and it will start beeping and it will start slowing down and the scooter actually will turn off before it gets off campus which is fairly handy um so yeah that's kind of that's kind of it and then going into you you spoke a bit a little bit about you know speed and you know in areas whereby you can you know stop scooters if they're going over pedestrian areas let's say yeah so if, if we've got you know an area in ucd with say for example first of all you know, the average scooter goes around 30 kilometers an hour. We've reduced our average speed to around 13. No, sorry, our average ma- or our max speed to around 13, which brings about an average speed of maybe 10. Um, just because you're on a university campus, high footfall, uh, it's just we need it to be safe. Um, there's no need to be going 30 kilometers an hour through UCD. Mm. Uh, so I suppose what we have as well with areas with high footfall, um, areas with high footfall, uh, we can say, okay, well, this location and we can map it out on the app say that area uh, the max speed is only five kilometers per hour just you know you can have dismount areas where people have to actually step off and walk with the scooter things like that so 
So that's all to be negotiated with the actual university itself, but these are the things that you know, our software is capable of doing. Brilliant. Just, just getting on to the last few, last few questions, then. What, what are the biggest difficulties you've gone through or you see yourself going through? Um, obviously, you've gone through a massive amount and you can hear it you know, with, with, with how you're talking. You've built some serious resilience in you know, even having conversations with your prior, being soundboards for each other. What sort of key difficulties do you, do you see yourself encountering in the next you know, three to six months? Um, so I think it's a tough one. It's hard to know. I think, I think the actual difficulty is you know, getting investors to take that first step. Well, sorry, not first step, but um, actually, you know, there's, a, there's huge CapEx required in launching fleets of electric scooters. These scooters are expensive. So if you want to go to, you know, if you need a thousand scooters to launch in the city, you know, you really need people to believe in you. The second thing is, you know, obviously um, with new technology, there's often vandalism associated with it. So, you know, you go to, um, say Dublin Bikes, when they started, you know, they were getting thrown in the Liffey. Uh, Bleeper Bikes experienced the same problem. And pretty much every bike sharing or scooter sharing fleet experienced the same thing when they come into a city. So that's the thing about being the first entry into a market. So there's a thing called a hype curve, right? So a hype curve means that with electric scooters, the usage for the first, say, um, two months is completely unprecedented to what the average is. So people actually use the scooters so much in the first two months out of curiosity mainly. Uh, and then, you know, a proportion of them say, okay, um, these are actually practical. So, you know, and then you've got your kind of your regular users, if that makes sense. But with that hype curve comes kind of a hype curve in vandalism. So the first two months, yeah, you, you, the fleets normally experience a lot of vandalism. People just getting them, trying to go down the stairs on them or throwing them in the river or whatever. Um, so it's kind of about managing that. Um, and that, they're kind of things that, you know, we're going to be really fo- hon- honing in on right before we launch is like, how do we manage vandalism and things like that? It's going to be questions that councils are going to be looking at. You know, most councils that are launching bike sharing schemes will have launched uh, bike, sh- uh, sorry, most councils that are launching uh, electric scooter uh, fleets will have launched uh, bike fleets before that, and they will have will know all about the vandalism. So it's about how do we manage that. So it could be anything from you know taking them in at night in some areas, or it could be um, automated smart locks, you know, to make sure you're locking them for bike racks and things like that. But you know, it's to be negotiated with councils. But I can imagine that will be uh, an issue in itself. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, listen, Charlie, I'm not going to take any more of your time. Uh, thanks a million for, for, for tuning in this week. Um, and I'll put Charlie's details in the uh, about section below. And if anyone wants to reach out to him, I'm sure Charlie is more than, more than happy to, to go into any further detail. Absolutely. Yeah. Charlie, Thank thanks a million. Done. And uh, have a great day. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.